In September 1891, Gates took an office in the Temple Court building in New York City, not far from Rockefeller's Standard Oil offices at 26 Broadway. He continued his work for the Education Society even while he took charge of Rockefeller's philanthropy. The supplicants who hounded Rockefeller almost like wild animals were sent to Gates' office. I did my best to soothe ruffled feelings, to listen to uh, fully to every plea and weigh fairly the merits of every cause, Gates recalled of his uh, days at Temple Court. With the same systemic thoroughness that marked his report for the Education Society, Gates investigated each request that came his way. I found not a few of Mr. Rockefeller's habitual charities to be worthless and practically fraudulent. But on the other hand, I gradually developed and introduced into all his charities the principle of scientific giving, and he found himself in no long time laying aside retail, giving almost wholly, and entering safely and pleasurably into the field of wholesale philanthropy. Gates's first act on behalf of wholesale philanthropy was to increase Rockefeller's contributions to state and regional Baptist agencies and cut off contributions to individual churches, missions, and charity organizations by forcing every church and mission to get their aid from centralized denominational boards, Gates increased the latter's power over the far-flung flock. Not long after he moved to New York, Gates took charge of Rockefeller's many investments outside the standard companies. As with his charities, Rockefeller always intended to check on his investments thoroughly before buying into them. Often he was persuaded by acquaintances to invest in a project or industry they assured him would pay off handsomely. Most of the immense surplus wealth that Rockefeller was taking out of oil, he was putting not into charity, but into good many different industries. By 1893, he had accumulated, besides the standard 67 major investments valued at $23 million in railroads, mining, manufacturing, and banks, it occurred to me, Rockefeller later recalled, that Mr. Gates, who had a great store of common sense, though no especial technical information about factories and mills, might aid me in securing some first-hand information as to how these concerns were actually prospering. He asked Gates to investigate some of the investments when he happened to be in the area on education society business. Gates checked on several Rockefeller's distant stakes, an immense land speculation scheme in Pacific Northwest that two fellow parishioners of Rockefeller's Fifth Avenue Baptist Church had persuaded the oil baron to invest in, a $600,000 investment in a West Superior, Wisconsin steel mill and land speculation fraud recommended by the same brethren and a smaller iron furnace in Alabama. Gates demonstrated his various abilities and singular value to his employer. His report was a model of what such a report should be. Rockefeller remarked with uncharacteristic praise, it stated the facts, and in this case, they were almost all unfavorable. One investment that Rockefeller thought was earning $1,000 a day was instead losing that amount. When more investigation by Gates of some uh, reputably rich gold mines in Colorado that turned out to be a complete fraud settled the matter for Rockefeller. His income was now upwards of $10 million a year. He was physically and emotionally coming a part of the seams, and he desperately needed a lieutenant in whom he could place complete confidence. He asked Gates to drop his office in the Temple Court building and share his private offices at 26 Broadway. That, wrote Gates, is how I came to be a businessman. The Reverend Frederick T. Gates, the making of a Rockefeller medicine man. It is not surprising that Gates should be such a appealing assistant in both philanthropy and finance. Although he graduated from the Baptist-controlled Rochester University and the Baptist Seminary in Rochester, and then spent eight years in a ministry, Gates was a at heart, a businessman in spiritual clothing. As he himself said in his autobiography, much of my life has been, in fact, a unconscious preparation for successful business. My interesting experience in selling horrors, my, my months as a clerk in the country store, and as cashier of a country bank, my interest in my father's financial affairs, 
and the ways and means of paying our debts, my studies of political economy under Dr. Anderson at Rochester, my close study of the finances of our church building in Minneapolis, a habit of looking at things in their financial tendencies and relations, my study of denominational finances at home and abroad, all these things had given me a business experience and my mind a financial turn. Gates was nearly 38 when he went to work for Rockefeller. His early years were spent in rural poverty. His father had studied medicine but turned to the Baptist ministry for his life's work. The Elder Gates' successive congregations were mainly poor farmers in rural New York. His family shared that poverty, which bred at least part of Frederick's determination to leave it behind in his own life. When the family moved to Forest City, Kansas, Frederick began but had to quit high school and then taught school to earn money to help his family pay off accumulating debt on their farm. Through high school and college jobs, Gates worked with a characteristic diligence and energy and discovered how many he pleased, how much he pleased his employers. His shrewd salesmanship earned him $1,500 for selling Haro's. Gates was a developing a sense of where his ambition might eventually take him. Young Gates' experiences with religion were as important in shaping his future life as were his experiences with poverty. The best that religion had to offer me as a boy, he wrote near the end of his life, was death in heaven, the very things I most dreaded, being a normal, healthy boy. With his teaching job, Gates developed a strong attraction to intellectual and personal elements of religion, though his conversion was not an emotional one. He found Christ's social and moral teachings very attractive. I was drawn to his person and character, and that throughout my life I wanted to side with him and his friends against the world and his enemies. Such, frankly, frankly, was the only conversion I ever had. He found his seminary training so academic as to leave him poorly prepared for ministerial work. He dispensed with the philosophical idealism of seminary and had cultivated, and from his own reading, his life experiences and examination of economic and social issues affecting his congregation, Gates took up a pragmatic philosophy that was more in keeping with his personality and his ambition. His fundraising work for his poor parish in Minneapolis and his less solemn, more modern sermons attracted a bigger congregation and with it more wealth. One day, George Pillsbury, whose flower fortune made him the wealthiest Baptist in the Northwest, asked Gates's advice in making up his will, and especially in leaving $200,000 to a Baptist school. Pillsbury was very pleased with Gates's suggestion that he immediately give $50,000 to the school on the condition that the denomination in Minnesota raise an equal amount to assure their committed interest in it and that he bequeath another 150000 to the school in his will. Baptist leaders were also pleased and commissioned Gates to raise their 50000 share of the funds. Gates uh, resigned his pastorate and took up the challenge. So effective were his methods of buttonholing Baptists in the state that he had soon raised $60,000. Gates knew he had found his calling. He developed a number of rules for fundraising, which he had learned mostly on the pastorate. And a couple years later, he wrote them down at the request of his admirers in the trade. Dress well, act in a dignified manner, pretend the visit will be a short one, be good-natured, and keep your victim also good-natured. Let him feel that he is giving it, not that it is being taken away from him with violence. Rule number seven he followed unswervingly through his nearly four decades of service to Rockefeller. Appeal only to the noblest motives. His own mind will suggest to him the lower and selfish ones, but he will not wish you to suppose that he has thought of them. He wishes you to believe him to be giving only from the highest motives. In a few years, Gates rose from pastor of an average Baptist congregation in Minneapolis to a statewide position with the denomination in Minnesota, to chief officer of the Baptist National Education Society, to the side of Mr. Rockefeller himself, 
administering a panoply of investments and an immense philanthropy. As soon as he joined Rockefeller's private office to manage his finances, Gates began a meticulous evaluation of all Rockefeller's holdings outside the state of trust. He was given a free hand in, in reorganizing investments and corporations alike and was provided with assistance, credit, and confidential information. I had every needed tool, Gates remembered, and the machinery was well-oiled and without the least friction. No man of serious business responsibilities ever had a happier business life than I. No man who was ever furnished with more of an external elements of success or given better opportunities. In some companies, Gates bought enough stock to take control and put it in, in management acceptable to him and Rockefeller. Other investments were sold off completely. In the end, Gates was made president of 13 corporations in which Rockefeller now had a controlling interest. He added sizable chunks to Rockefeller's geometrically increasing fortune, the grandest chunk being the $55 million profit Gates made on selling the Masabi Iron Ore Range and associated industries that he had helped develop. Although Gates came to Rockefeller's employment a poor man, he soon remedied this unfortunate condition. While executive secretary of Baptist Education Society, Gates was paid a then respectable income of $2,500 a year. When he moved east and opened up the office in Temple Court Building, Rockefeller had added $1,500 to his income. With added responsibilities led to annual increases in salary, always paid by the corporations which I managed. Until after 10 years with Rockefeller, he was getting a salary of $30,000 a very good income in the first decade of the century. Out of his earnings, Gates and his wife had saved enough to pay for their Montclair, New Jersey home and invested some $60,000 in companies he had organized and managed for Rockefeller. That small investment brought him more than $500,000 when he sold his shares in 1902. Prudent investments with few losses gradually increased this sum. In 1916, Gates began converting all his investments into then-rising and profitable bank stock and encouraged Rockefeller to do the same, recommending especially the Chase National Bank, which was paying dividends of 20% on invested capital. By the time, his death was, by the time of his death in 1929, Gates was a wealthy man, though. Needless to say, his fortune fell far short of his employer's. Though Rockefeller never paid direct com compliments to any person, he more than once recorded his appreciation of Gates's phenomenal business ability. In response to the reporter's question, who is the greatest of all businessmen you have known, Rockefeller heaped warm praise on Gates. He combines business skills and philanthropic aptitude to a higher degree than any other man I have ever known. Though Gates was involved with Rockefeller's finances in important ways, his organization of Rockefeller's philanthropies, and especially the medical programs, makes him historically significant. In 1897, John D. Rockefeller Jr. graduated from Brown University and was cautiously trying to find a place for himself in the world preempted by his father, his hereditary position in the world, of industry and finance left him little room for any achievement that he could call his own. His own name was inseparable from his father's, who was perhaps the most vilified of all great robber barons. The one area in which he might stake out new ground and at the same time help clear the family name was philanthropy. And thus he entered his father's private offices at 26 Broadway, an imperium presided over by Reverend Gates. With difficulty, Gates and Mr. Rockefeller Jr. developed a working relationship. Jr. was then 23 years old, inexperienced, and reserved to the point of shyness. Gates, 20 years his senior, did not hide his self-confidence derived from varied experience and personal achievement. He was ebullient. Nevertheless, Jr. learned from Gates and from his own successes and failures and built an independent role for himself in both philanthropy and finance. For his part, Gates learned to tolerate this scion of the man he worked for and truly respected. Gates considered Junior diligent but unimaginative. He was a homemade and home trade, he recalled disdainfully. 
Rockefeller, Rockefeller Sr. had found, as his biographer Alan Nevins observed, just the combination of qualities he needed. Gates endowed primarily with imagination, fire, and vision. The son endowed primarily with hard sense, caution, public spirit, and conscientiousness. Gates and Jr. investigated new lines of philanthropy and the value of a senior's investments, bringing major proposals for action on both to the financier for final decisions. Gates wrote his views in eloquent reports. Jr. relied on oral persuasion. Gates was a brilliant dreamer and creator. Jr. recalled later, I was the salesman, the go-between with the father at the uh, opportune moment. Senior seldom jumped into any new venture. I'll let this idea simmer, he often told his son in Gates. Then weeks, months, and even years later, moved by considerations inscrutable to his assistants, he was ready to act. Gates was also quite a contrast to his employer. As Raymond Fosdick, president of Rockefeller Foundation for more than a decade, revealed, Mr. Gates was a vivid, outspoken, self-revealing personality who brought an immense gusto to his work. Mr. Rockefeller was quiet, cool, taciturn, about his thoughts and purposes, almost stoic in his repression. Mr. Gates had an eloquence which could be passionate when he was aroused. Mr. Rockefeller, when he spoke at all, spoke in a slow, measured fashion, lucidly and penetratingly, but without raising his voice and without gestures. Mr. Gates was overwhelming and sometimes overbearing in argument. Mr. Rockefeller was a man of infinite patience who never showed irritation or spoke chidingly about anybody. From this triumvirate came the influential philanthropies that asserted extraordinary leadership in shaping the social, economic, and political order of the 20th century. Rockefeller, the individualistic captain of industry from the rough-and-tumble old order that was being transformed at the turn of the century, supplied the money but left the directing to his lieutenants. Gates, the transition figure from unbridled individualism to the discipline of the corporation, provided systemic methods and a rudimentary strategy for asserting corporate, asserting corporate capitalism's need for supportive social institutions. Junior, emerging gradually as the nation's foremost representative of modernism in corporate relations with labor and the public, brought a refinement and sensitivity to the philanthropic work being developed by Gates. The programs and strategies that emerged from this center of financial power had an enormous impact, especially on medical care and health systems in the United States and throughout the world. The General Education Board, $129 million for Strategic Philanthropy. Gates shared Carnegie's fears that excessive hereditary wealth diminished individual initiative and achievement, that it saps the participation of its bearer in the social and economic processes and make society str- that makes society stronger. Your fortune is rolling up, rolling up like an avalanche, he, he warned Rockefeller. You must keep up with it. You must distribute it faster than it grows. If you do that, it will, if you don't do that, it will crush you and your children and your children's children. Having acquired the fortune, it fell to Rockefeller and his associates to maintain it as a trust for the people, just as Carnegie had advocated. It is the duty of men of means, Rockefeller wrote early in this century, to maintain the title to their property and to administer their funds until some man or body of men shall rise up capable of administering for the general good the capital of the country better than they can. In his view, neither experiences with state and national legislators, slatures, nor schemes of socialism offered any promise that wealth would be more wisely administered for the general good than it was by its private owners. Since the owners of capital were mortal men, it was incumbent on them to provide some ongoing trust to see that their wealth would be wisely uh, even after they passed, would be used wisely even after they passed from the scene. There was nothing new in this concept and understood by the Rockefellers as they launched their first grant-giving foundation the General Education Board, to aid Southern education. 
Charitable trusts, independent of the state and the church, have had legal status in Anglo-Saxon law since the Statute of Charitable Uses was enacted by Queen Elizabeth in 1601. Most of these, however, have been narrowly prescribed uses, endowing a particular hospital, giving relief to wayward girls in Brooklyn, and providing scholarships for young men entering mechanical engineering at a particular college. However, there were a few precedents that greatly influenced the creation of General Education Board, providing the first of its strategic philanthropic programs aimed at transforming major social institutions. At the close of the Civil War, merchant banker George Peabody provided $2 million for a Southern Education Fund. The war had left the South in ruins and its schools destroyed or otherwise defunct. A generation of Southerners was growing up uneducated and essentially illiterate. The Peabody Education Fund hired Barnes Sears, the president of Brown University, to set up a grant program to help schools that were run and generally supported by Southerners. Sears was succeeded by Jabez L. M. Curry, a Confederate politician and planter from Alabama, who had saved his land from confiscation after the Civil War by swearing allegiance to the United States. The Peabody Fund set an example for John F. Slater, a textile manufacturer from Connecticut who endowed a $1 million fund in 1882 to educate Southern blacks. By the end of the 19th century, increasing numbers of Northern businessmen, Southern reformers were coalescing around the need to develop Southern schools in general and educate Southern blacks in particular. The South was not only economically and educationally undeveloped, It was the section of the country from which militant populism still received its widest political support, threatening the ambitions of Southern liberal reformers and Northern conservative businessmen who wanted to modernize and industrialize the region. In 1899, these leaders organized the first of several conferences of Southern education. John D. Rockefeller was a guest at the third conference in 1901. Robert C. Ogden, a partner of John Wanamaker and general manager of their New York department store, chartered a special train dubbed Millionaire Special by hostile Southern newspapers to bring Northern businessmen on a tour of Southern black schools and then to a conference with Southern activists in the cause. Junior and other guests visited the Hampton and Tuskegee Institutes, and other schools, and ended their tour with a meeting in the Winston-Salem. This conference established a permanent organization called the Southern Education Board to raise money among Northerners, assume formal leadership of the campaign to develop Southern schools, and conduct propaganda on its behalf through the board's budget. Uh, Though the board's budget was low, not more than $40,000 a year, and they never gave grants as a Peabody and Slater funds were doing, the SEB hired agents to carry their campaign to influential Southerners and state legislatures. Like the Peabody and Slater funds, essentially combined under leadership of their chief agent, J.L.M. Curry, the Southern Education Board unanimously supported only industrial education for blacks. Schools organized around this model taught the rudiments of literacy and emphasized industrial and agricultural skills, disciplined work, thrift, and right living. Hampton Institute, whose chief trustee was Ogden and whose principal was fellow SEB member Hoos Frissel, was a, the prototype of industrial schools for blacks. Booker T. Washington, an early graduate of Hampton, founded a similar school in Tuskegee, Alabama and became the country's chief black proponent of the grandest strategy of racial progress. For half a century, this model of education guided the works of the movement of compulsory schooling, and now it was the centerpiece of the progressive education movement, sweeping educators and businessmen alike into a public, into a national education reform campaign. Northern and Southern businessmen were enthusiastic. Every element for success exists in the South, the manufacturer's record declared in support, in raw material, in climate, in the forces of nature, and above all, in an abundant supply of labor 
which when properly trained and disciplined will be the main reliance of the South in the future for its prosperity. It only remains for the South to do, the, do its duty to its black population by way of training and educating in the simple manual trades. With the support of Northern money, the industrial schools flourished and the few genuine schools for blacks struggled under their less than benign neglect. The Southern Education Board and its allies won grudging acceptance of schools for blacks from Southern white supremacist political leaders, and in return, Northern members of the SEB campaigned in the North for acceptance of black disenfranchisement and Jim Crow laws as the best way to, for progress for blacks. The white people are to be the leaders, to take the initiative, to have the directive control of all matters pertaining to civilization and the highest interests of our beloved land. Curry, former Confederate officer and now chief of staff of the Southern Campaign, brazenly proclaimed, This white supremacy does not mean hostility to the Negro, but friendship for him. For John D. Rockefeller Jr. and his 1901 tour and conference in the South were one of the outstanding events in my life. Filled with a sense of mission, Jr. discussed the new Southern Education Board and its programs with his father. Gates, his friend Morris K. Jessup, and Dr. Wallace Buttrick, the portly and jovial secretary of the Baptist Home Mission Society, who also attended the conference and was now a member of the SEB, a small group of, was formed to develop an ambitious project in support of the Southern work. In January 1902, they outlined a munificent philanthropic enterprise. In February, an expanded group met for dinner at Junior's house and worked through the evening. Junior announced a pledge he had secured from his father for $1 million to spend over the next 10 years, the first and smallest of many gifts to come. They formed a board of trustees to oversee the expenditures and appointed Buttrick executive secretary. The South, with its varied resources and products, their memorandum of agreement observed, has immense industrial potentialities, and its prosperous future will be assured with the right kind of education and training for its children of both races. The General Education Board was announced to the press. The object of this association, they explain, is to provide a vehicle through which capitalists of the North who sincerely desire to assist in the great work of Southern education may act with assurance that their money be, will be wisely used. The General Education Board, with its large resources, quickly became the locus of, of leadership in the Southern campaign. At its first meeting in 1901, the Southern Education Board had arranged a community of interest with Peabody and Slater funds. By 1903, According to Southern Board member Frissel, the Peabody and Slater boards are now acting very largely through the General Education Board. In fact, a more interlocking directorate could not be found, even among the Standard Oil companies. Several trustees of the Slater and Peabody boards were trustees of the General Education Board. Curry was a member or agent of all four funds. Buttrick was a member of the Southern Board executive secretary of the GEB, and from 1903 to 1910, he was an agent of the Slater Fund, and so on. While the General Education Board developed other programs over the next several decades, medical ones prominently among them, their work in the South remained important and never deviated substantially from their original perspective. Over the years, the GEB worked to make all schools more responsive to our social, economic, and professional needs. The black population's role in society was clear. The board believed the Negro must be educated and trained, that he may be more sober, more industrious, more competent. When the GEB finally came to support full-fledged colleges for blacks, it was not because their general outlook on race relations had changed. College training would be provided for be provided for carefully selected Negroes who will lead the race in its efforts to educate and improve itself. The Blacks' leaders must be trained so that looking to them for guidance, and he does, he may be as well guided as possible. The GEB was not concerned only with education of Blacks. It worked to build up high schools for whites and for Blacks throughout the South. 
always with an eye for to creating a local responsibility for self-help, what Gates called the foundation of character and social life itself. The board's strategy was to stimulate and organize community support for school taxes. The GEB got each state university to create a professorship for secondary education. Then, with the university's approval, the board defined the duties of it, the position and named the person to be hired and, in return, paid the person's salary and all its expenses. The main function of this professor was not to teach, but to organize. He would visit the towns of his state as an officer of the university, laden with its wisdom and its moral authority, and develop the channel local for local support for high schools and taxes to support them. At the end of the two decades of work, the GEB had spent a little over $3 million promoting public schools in the rural and urban South. They considered the plan effective beyond our most sanguine anticipations and took considerable credit for the 2,000 new high schools built in that period at a cost of $60 million, for which annual appropriations in the southern states increased from $1.7 million in 1905 to $15 million in 1922, all raised by local taxation. The public schools program of the GEB led to a farm demonstration program run for the board by Seaman Knapp, and then to the first of a long tradition of public health programs conducted by the Rockefeller Foundations. Rooted in the same concern for Southern economic and social development that guided the public schools programs, the public health programs at the first at first in the Southern states and then exported around the country, or around the world, that rather, became important supports for the growing domination by U.S. capital, trade, and military power. Gates, a charter member of the GEB and its chairman from 1907 to 1917, was the eloquent orator and, in Junior's words, the brilliant dreamer and creator of, the, of most of these programs. The permanence of the General Education Board, which assured with a broad congressional charter, dedicated the foundation to the promotion of education within the United States. Senator Nelson Aldrich, Jr.'s father-in-law and a powerful representative of business in Washington, took the bill into his own hands and put it through in record time. It was officially chartered in 1903 of January, a year after it began its first Southern program, yet the most influential work of the GB was yet to come. Gates took into his own bosom the worries about Rockefeller's still-growing fortune. I have lived with this great fortune of yours daily for 15 years, he wrote his employer in 1905. To it, its increase and its uses, I have given every thought until it has become a part of myself, almost, almost as if it were my own. Recognizing the mortality that all persons must face, Gates laid out the alternatives to Rockefeller. One is that you and your children, while living, shall make final and complete disposition of this great trust for the good of mankind. The other is that you shall not do this, but shall hand it down to unborn generations for them to decide how this trust shall finally be discharged for humanity. For Gates, embracing Carnegie's gospel and fearing the powerful tendencies to social demoralization of inherited wealth, the first alternative was the only moral one. He proposed that Rockefeller decide what major lines of work for human progress he wanted to serve and who should administer the funds and then create an endowment to provide funds in per perpetuity under competent management with proper provision for succession. Gates then suggested several funds for several areas of work. A great fund for the promotion of the system of higher education in the United States. A fund for the promotion of medical research throughout the world. A fund for the promotion of the fine arts. And more. These funds should be so large that to become a trustee of one of them is to make a man at once a public character. The work of these enterprises should employ the best talent of the entire human race. Junior followed this letter with his own enthusiastic endorsements of Gates' proposal. 
Within two weeks, Rockefeller Sr. gave the General Education Board $10 million and followed that a year and a half later with another $32 million. By 1921, Rockefeller's gifts to the GED totaled more than $129 million. Larger and more numerous endowments began to flow to the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research, fathered by Gates from his employer's fortune in 1901, and soon discussions began that led Gates' 1905 letter to the creation of a much larger and broader fund, the Rockefeller Foundation, to which Senior gave more than $182 million. It is not so clear that Gates is only concerned in recommending that Rockefeller himself to dispose of his fortune was the danger of inherited wealth to its possessors. The notoriety that accrued to Rockefeller and other robber barons, along with their profits, cast a long shadow on the future of wealth. And the Rockefellers felt as much it felt the chill as much as anyone. Henry Demarest Lloyd in Wealth Against Commonwealth, published in 1894, and Ida Tarbell in a magazine series ending in 1904, had tarred and feathered the Standard Oil Trust. The socialist movement was winning the support of working people throughout the country for its program to do away with private capital altogether. And perhaps most frightening of all, Upstanding middle-class Americans, professionals, and businessmen with values very much like the Rockefellers themselves were joining the call for progressive reforms. The progressive movement, while firmly supporting capitalism, was calling for constraints on the accumulation and concentration of private wealth. Roosevelt was elected in 1904 on a platform that at least threatened to break up the monopolies. I trembled, Gates later recalled, as I witnessed the unreasoning popular resentment at Mr. Rockefeller's riches, to the mass of the people, a national menace. Gates might believe that Rockefeller used his, used his wealth always and only in the public interest, that his fortune had been created by economies rather than by theft, that his wide investments in industry and finance constituted vast permanent contributions to the wealth and well-being of the American people but few people in the country not connected with 26 Broadway agree with him. In the fall of 1906, the federal government launched a major suit to break up Standard Oil Trust. And that litigation began its five-year journey through the courts. After Rockefeller gave the GEB $32 million in 1907, to finance Gates' plan to create a system of higher education in the United States, many respectable newspapers and magazines suggested that the purpose of Mr. Rockefeller's large gift is to head off, if possible, the teaching of socialism, which is on the increase in the number of universities. Also, in 1907, federal judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis hit the Indiana Standard Company with a $29 million fine for obtaining rebates on its railroad shipments, one of the economies in which Gates and Rockefeller took pride. No Oriental despot has committed such arbitrary acts of confiscation as the present administration is responsible for under the forms of uh, for under the forms of law. Gates railed. The Landis fine was squashed on appeal. But the specter of dissolution and ultimately the confiscation pursued to Rockefellers and many of their class. The Rockefeller philanthropies created new programs and with new images for the benefactors. The programs appealed to their perceptions of social needs, but in their perceptions, society's needs were indistinguishable from their own. Colleges were expanded and organized into a system of higher education to produce the professionals and managers the corporate society badly needed. But the GEB, for two decades, consciously followed Gates' directive to strengthen private rather than state universities because private institutions, controlled by men and women like themselves, would be more likely to direct popular opinion into the right channels. The medical philanthropies, outwardly appearing only to fill an obvious social need, helped to develop a medical care system peculiarly suited to the needs of corporate capitalism, as we will see in the subsequent, ch subsequent cha chapters.
Social Managers for a Corporate Society. It is clear that John D. Rockefeller Sr. was neither an initiator nor a strategist in his philanthropies. In the early years, it was Gates and then Gates and Jr. whose ideas and strategies shaped the elder Rockefeller's fortune into purposeful programs. In part, the insight they showed concerning the needs of capitalist society may be attributed to their individual personalities shaped by their own life experiences. But they were also representative of the new class of men, and very few women at the time, who provided the managerial skills needed by corporate industry and finance. Unlike the individualistic entrepreneurs who built the enormous industrial and financial empires around themselves in the latter 19th century, these new managers were more sensitive to the smooth workings of their enterprises. In industry, management's role was to rationalize production, to divide the productive process into efficient units, and simultaneously to coordinate each with the other to produce a unified organization linked in a similar, similarly coordinated fashion with disparate sources of investment capital and raw materials at one end of the production line and with a system of distribution and marketing at the other end. Analogous managerial roles were also developed in government bureaus and departments, then in colleges and the emerging universities. The last major area to which skilled management was directed were the social services, charity and social welfare programs, philanthropic foundations, and of course, medicine. The foundations were key instruments in early efforts to rationalize social services, public health and medical care under under the control of specially trained managers in those fields, and the foundations themselves became the turf of the same management class. It became little difference whether one owned a substantial share of the country's corporate wealth or whether one simply ran the factories and institutions owned by the wealthy. The actions of each group were essentially the same, and their values were quite similar. They both accepted the prevailing economic, social, and political system as given, and they sought to make the system work smoothly. Some of these system managers use charity to try and make capitalist society, whose ideal model is a purely competitive marketplace, a less rigid and heartless one, as a recent proponent of this view put it. He believes that philanthropy should provide at least something softening of the corners and relaxation, the rigid rule of self-interest. Others like Gates and John D. Rockefeller Jr., conceived of a more strategic role for philanthropy, the transformation of social institutions. They worked to make the nation's colleges and universities into a system that would more efficiently yield technically trained and properly socialized professionals and managers for the system. They developed new roles for professionals as managers, and they helped rationalize the institutions in which these professionals worked. Men like the senior Rockefeller and Andrew Carnegie knew little of this work. They had understood its relevance to industry where they had been the first ones in oil and steel, respectively, to create vertically integrated corporations, owning and controlling the entire process from oil wells and iron ore mines to transportation, refining and manufacturing, distribution and marketing. But running a corporation is different from running a corporate society. And though they understood the need to take more control over social institutions, they did not understand how. Carnegie, egotistically and individualistic, thought he understood. Until Andrew Carnegie began giving away libraries in the 1880s, the world had never seen such vast fortune applied to private philanthropy. This remarkable innovation in magnitude of philanthropic wealth due, of course, to his insatiable ambition in industry rather than any strategic genius in philanthropy, gave him a social power so vast that it proved truly befuddling. Armed with a crude social philosophy, he set forth to civilize the lower classes and set a model of responsibility for the upper echelons of society. The society he hoped to preserve was one based explicitly on enormous disparities of wealth. And he attempted to preserve the individualism he and other social Darwinists revered with a largely individualistic approach to social transformation. His programs represented his own personalized view, shared in varying degrees by contemporary capitalists. 
But Carnegie's vision was a limited one, and his programs often stepped over the edge into absurdity. When Carnegie retired from still business in 1901, his philanthropic plans were vague and scattered. In the words of his biographer, John F. Wall, for someone who had written so extensively and preached so eloquently as he on the duties of the man of wealth, it is rather surprising that he faced this task better armed with platitudes than with any concrete program of action. After several years of massive spending without a real plan, Carnegie set up his foundations and his hired managers began accomplishing what he had not. In 1905, Carnegie began to move from his individualistic method of dispersing money to a more rationalized systemic model. Appalled by the pitiful incomes of college professors, usually not more than $400 per year, Carnegie, Carnegie had meant to do something about them for some time, but it was Henry S. Pritchett, the president of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, who moved him to action. While visiting Carnegie at his ancient castle in Scottish Highlands in the summer of 1904, Pritchett lamented the difficulties he had in attracting young scientists and engineers to teach at MIT. Academic salaries could not compare with those offered by private industry. A few colleges even had a pension system to provide, and few colleges even had pension systems to provide a minimum of financial security for professors. There were more discussions the following winter, and in April 1905, Carnegie announced the creation of his college teachers' pension fund with an initial endowment of $10 million in U.S. steel bonds. A board of trustees was selected, consisting mainly of presidents of the most elite universities and colleges in the country. Pritchett was appointed president of the new Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. Under Pritchett's guidance, the new foundation set out a, to recast American higher education. The free pensions became the carrot at the end of the stick that colleges would follow down the path of reform. An applicant college or university had to have a minimum of $200,000 endowment to qualify for the pension program. Neither state colleges nor those controlled by religious denominations were eligible. Finally, to be eligible, a school had to require of its students a prescribed minimum of high school preparation prior to admission. This last requirement proved a successful attempt by the foundation to throw its influence in favor of the differentiation between the secondary school and the college in order to create a system of schools intelligently related to each other and to the ambitions and needs of the democracy. Although only 52 of the original 421 applicants were eligible for the pension plans, other schools soon modeled themselves on the Carnegie system to make themselves eligible. Denominationally, the denominational colleges cut loose from their controlling churches to take advantage of the plan, and the foundation's rules were changed to include state institutions. Soon, virtually every high school and college in the country measured students' progress in the Carnegie units. A national system of education was taking shape with the prodding of Carnegie pensions and the Carnegie Foundation as the unofficial accrediting body. Almost immediately after opening the offices of Carnegie Foundation, Pritchett began consulting with the General Education Board. His only regret, he told GEB Executive Secretary Wallace Buttrick, was that, I did not come to you before renting my office, for it would be of great benefit to us to be located near you. Pritchard admired Gates, often asked for his advice, and tried to get Carnegie to mend his philanthropic ways. In fact, the record left behind suggests that Pritchett's ideas on systematizing higher education were derived from Gates's. The leadership that attracted this following was Gates's vision of how wealth could rationalize higher education. He described a picture of the GEB through its moral influence, as well as its money, fostering cooperation among colleges and universities and securing economies in administration and teaching force and in the use of men. He hoped that such a philanthropic board properly endowed would select and direct the resources of higher education, much as Standard Oil Company had transformed the universal competitive system that char characterized the oil industry in 1870. 
Rockefeller was fortunate to find a man like Gates to develop wholesale philanthropy for him. As Jr. and other officers of the Rockefeller Foundations readily admitted, Gates was the source of the most strategic ideas, major programs, and important policies in the Foundation's first decade and a half, with Jr. developing an increasingly important role. In that time, there was no serious challenge raised to Gates's dominance. The Board of Trustees was the final authority, but other staff members knew that, that if they had Gates's and Jr. support, we were on safe ground and would have little problem winning approval from the board. Gradually, however, Gates's influence declined. While the times changed and the much younger junior became the leader of a growing image of corporate responsibility and concern, Gates's limitations became apparent. Following the 1914 massacre of striking miners and their wives and children in Ludlow, Colorado, mining company controlled by the Rockefellers, Junior had held largely responsible by public opinion throughout the nation, was held largely responsible by public opinion throughout the nation. But the posture he developed afterwards, formulated by consultant W.L. Mackenzie King, made him the leading representative of the new, more benign face of industrial relations that was winning support from many corporate executives. When Junior, who had became who had been called before a presidential commission created to investigate such problems, claimed he thought it perfectly proper for labor to associate itself and to organize groups for the advancement of its legitimate interests. Gates criticized him for adopting a spirit of conciliation towards those who came to him in the spirit of these unionists. Yet it was junior support of the company unions that was assuaging public opinion and winning the respect of other corporate leaders. Gates did not adopt himself to the challenging times. With Gates's leadership passing from the scene, especially following his resignation from the GEB Executive Committee in 1917, problems of accountability began to be raised. Trustees who had willingly followed Gates now found the foundations without comparable leadership. Other foundation officers had never demonstrated the broad and clear perspective that Gates had shown, and with Gates gone from daily participation in foundation activities, a vacuum was created. Trustees wanted to fill it by increasing their participation. Foundation officers quarreled with one another. The foundation drifted, and with Gates, these problems did not arise because his carefully developed and forcefully presented proposals won immediate support. Gates never expected the trustees to play an important role in, in social innovation. When a trustee suggested that GEB members were appointed to throw new light on the great problem of education in this country, Gates impatiently explained that he and Rockefeller gave an overwhelming preponderance to businessmen in composing the board to fix the policies of this board along the lines of successful experience. They knew, he said, that successful businessmen would steer the ship along traditional lines and would not be carried out of the course by any temporary breeze, even by hurricanes of sentiment. The trustees were there to assure in perpetuity that Rockefeller's money would be judiciously applied to preserving the system and strengthening it, letting professional educators promote innovative ideas while the trustees supported only those directions which seemed desirable and whose consequences were more certain. Though Gates ran the GEB with firm leadership and fiery tongue during his tenure as chairman, he and Junior both wanted the other trustees to take an active interest in the foundation. Without involvement, their interest and sense of responsibility for the fortune would decrease, the very thing to be avoided. In the remote future, Junior advised his father, you must, of necessity, trust to the character and integrity of the men who come after you. It was clearly just as important to encourage local communities to take responsibility for self-help. Gates' reasons for this guiding principle were moral, tactical, and strategic. He believed in the moral precepts of self-reliance and self-discipline. He also wanted to enlist the active participation of property owners in community institutions. Although they were not as reliable as the men appointed to the Rockefeller Foundations, the local ruling class recognized, as did he, and the, and he that the 
right to earn and hold surplus wealth marks the dawn of civilization. Gates, Jr., and Rockefeller all understood that to fund a local institution without requiring contributions and participation from local men and women of wealth would be to lessen these people's sense of responsibility for what goes on in the institution. They had a genuine concern for the preservation of their society and its preservation preservation required the active involvement of all those who had a stake in it. Rockefeller's involvement with the University of Chicago is a good example of this principle in action. Rockefeller contributed $35 million to the university during its first two decades compared with $7 million from all the other donors. He was consulted about appointments to the board of trustees and approved the initial list before it was finalized. But thereafter, Rockefeller did not desire to control the university, as many people charged. He prefers to rest the whole weight of their management on the shoulders of the proper officers. Gates wrote that the university president, on its behalf of his boss in 1892, donors can be certain that their gifts will be preserved and made continuously and largely useful after their own voices can no longer be heard, only in so far as they see wisdom and skill in the management, quite independently of themselves now. Rockefeller's trust in the management was well-founded. There is no evidence that he ever tried directly to influence the university administration to fire teachers who expressed, the, who expressed radical views. It was University of Chicago President Harper who took the initiative to drop Professor Edward Bemis after he made a speech following the 19, 1894 Pullman strike critical of the railroads. Rockefeller and Gates had merely appointed the right men to manage their philanthropic and financial enterprises, men who were led by values and considerations similar to their own and who could be counted on to do what was expected. In many ways, local authorities in whom Rockefeller placed his trust proved the correctness of this rule. One final important tactical reason for securing local involvement was to multiply the impact of each grant. The Rockefeller Foundations required virtually all recipients to raise an equal amount equal to or as much as four times greater than the grant being given by the foundation. Besides being chosen for their stabilizing influence, foundation trustees were also chosen for their prestige and authority of their names. Andrew Carnegie, Long Island Railroad President William H. Baldwin, Harvard President Charles W. Elliott, John Hopkins, President Daniel Coit, Oil, uh, Daniel Coit, Oilman Publisher Walter Hines Page, Banker George Foster Peabody, and other prestigious individuals were appointed to the OEB to secure general public approval and active and powerful public cooperation for OEB programs. In gaining support and in requiring matching contributions from others, the foundation was able to multiply the impact of the grant programs. By 1925, the OEB had given $60 million to the endowments of colleges and universities in the United States for certain reforms they deemed desirable, and they had, by their ma matching grant policy, required the institutions to raise an additional $140 million to support these OEB required changes. By 1928, the General Education Board had contributed some $50 million to medical schools for very specific reforms, generating total resources estimated at 10 times the amount for those same reforms. Thus, Rockefeller Philanthropies, under the guidance of skilled managers, developed self-consciously strategic programs. This program is described in detail in Chapter 4 to transform higher education and medical care, among other social institutions. The thrust of their programs was to systematize and rationalize these institutions to make them better serve the needs of corporate capitalism. The rise of industrial capitalism brought with it many new needs that provided opportunities for groups be besides the capitalist class. The work process was reshaped to reduce the cost and increase management's control of production. Scientists developed the basic understandings on which technological innovation was based. Engineers adapted scientific knowledge to production, designing new methods and machines that produced the need for skilled workers, increased productivity, and general, generally gave 
management more complete control of the entire production process. A new stratum of managers and professionals emerged in the society's class structure to design and organize production and the institutions that reproduce and control capitalist society's social relations. Colleges and universities became the training and research agencies producing knowledge and and reproducing engineers, scientists, lawyers, teachers, and other technicians and social managers. Managers were well paid for their efforts, and some, like Gates, were incorporated into the highest circles of the owning class. But despite their separation from the predominant ownership, managers of corporations and institutions alike still think and act as if though the firm belonged to them, as William Apple and Williams put it. Their commitments to the prevailing economic system are complete. Out of an early mercantilist philanthropy grew a new corporate philanthropy intended to ameliorate the lot of industrial capitalism's victims, but to shape and guide social institutions. Foundations were and are still important ramparts through which private wealth, acting through creative and loyal managers, influences and often controls universities, medical schools, and other public institutions. The Rockefeller Foundations established directions and strategies that other foundations followed. Gates led the Rockefeller philanthropy with its imagination, daring, and an intuitive sense of imagination and sense of educational strategy. Pritchett, following Gates' leadership, made Carnegie's foundation an engine of social transformation. In many ways, Gates, Pritchett, and other managers understood the workings and needs of capitalism better than the ostensible owners of the system did. Broad social transformations, however, required the participation of more than the ruling class. While the working class suffered greatly from the capitalist reorganization of production, some groups attached themselves to the ascending corporate class and benefited greatly. New occupations like engineering and social work and old ones like law and medicine gained elevated professional status in return for becoming the new order's managers of production, 